Welcome to worship. My name is Lori Bevenauer, senior pastor of this congregation and one who is excited to journey with you through an experience of being reformed today. So in that spirit of taking what already is and making it into something else, let's dive into worship. Let's go really to the heart of worship as we hear these words. Each week is a new week. It's another chance for us to say, here I am, use me. And each day is a new day. Another chance for us to say, thank you for yesterday. Thank you, God, for tomorrow. And every hour is a new hour. Another chance for us to say again and again, help us to make something new. We do not come to this time to stay the same. We do not come to this time to do what we've always done. We come to this time to be changed. So God, God, whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you are, change us, re 
form us. Help us to be surprised by your love again and again and again. In that spirit, let us worship together. In just a moment, you will hear our scripture today from the Gospel of John. And in that scripture, there's a really wonderful moment in which some Greek people come to the disciples and they say these words. They say, we want to see Jesus. And every time I read that, I think that could be the beginning, the ending, and the middle of all my prayers. I want to see Jesus. And maybe that sounds to be a little too much for you. But honestly, what it, would it be like if we could see one who challenges one who is always reaching out for those in need. One who is constantly with the outsider. One who has an expansive love that goes beyond and beyond and beyond. That's the Jesus I want to see. And maybe I won't see Jesus in an actual physical form. But maybe, just maybe, I can embrace those words and see Jesus in you and in the other. And that's what I bring to confession today. There is a great space between my desire to see Jesus and my actually doing anything about it. So in that spirit of making space, in a spirit of recognizing we have a lot of work to do, let's see what we can see as we confess together. Confession. Gracious God, we want to see you. We want to be known as the people who looked for Jesus. But not only that, we want to be people who have your covenant written on our hearts. Why do we feel so far away from that at times? What went wrong? Where did we lose our way? Could you, would you, once again, write on our fragile hearts? We would be so grateful. Amen. We wonder. We get lost. Again and again, stuff happens. And again and again, with what is already inside each of us, God reforms us. Dwell in the goodness that you are being remade every day, every hour, every minute. There is something changing and it is towards the good. Feel the goodness within you and know that you are loved just as you are. You are loved. Amen.
Holy God, Scripture tells us that your word is written on our hearts, but we struggle to hear it. Is it possible that we have covered up your words with our own self-narratives? Is it possible that we have erased your truth to write our own? Is it possible that we have forgotten your words entirely? Take us back to the beginning. Remove the self-talk that distracts. Clear away the cobwebs of doubt. Show us how to look inside ourselves for your truth and then write it on our hearts once more. We are listening. We are hopeful. We are here. Speak now. Amen. Today's reading is John 12, verses 20 through 33. Among those who had come up to worship at the Passover festival were some Greeks. They approached Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and put forth this request. Please, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, and together the two went to tell Jesus. Jesus replied, Now the hour has come for the chosen one to be glorified. The truth of the matter is, unless a grain of wheat falls on the ground and dies, it remains only a single grain. But if it dies, it yields a rich harvest. If you love your life, you'll lose it. If you hate your life in this world, you'll keep it for the eternal life. Anyone who wants to work for me must follow in my footsteps. And wherever I am, my worker will be there too. Anyone who works for me will be honored by Abba God. Now my soul is troubled. What will I say? Abba, save me from this hour, but it was for this very reason that I have come to this hour. Abba, glorify your name. A voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd stood nearby, heard this, and said it was a clap of thunder. Others said it was an angel speaking. Jesus answered, It was not for my sake that this voice came, but for yours. Sentence is now being passed on this world. Now the ruler of this world will be overthrown. And when I am lifted up from this earth, I will draw all people to myself. By these words, Jesus indicated the kind of death he would die.
welcome to a time of meditation, reflection, sermon, uh, a time to grapple with the scripture. Uh, my name is Lori Biebenauer, Senior Pastor of St. Peter's United Church of Christ in Carmel, Indiana. And with me is the Reverend Leah Roberts Moser, Pastor of Community UCC in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. And this is super fun for us. <laughs> so fun to get to talk with you about things that really matter. Um, so, yeah, so go ahead, because we should probably explain who we are and why we're doing this. Right, because I'm sure a a lot of our congregations are like, who is this person? So yeah. Lori and I have known each other for a long, long time. Um, and we were introduced to each other by Reverend Inika Mitchell, who said to us at some like national um, event at some point in our careers, you two, you should be friends. You should know each other. It was really subtle. <laughs> was exactly subtle like that. And, um, and then when Lori and I started talking to each other, we realized that we have been unbeknownst to us living parallel lives. Um, our moms are both weavers. Um, we both had tree themed weddings. Look, I wore my trees for you. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, we kind of follow each other in ways that are sometimes creepy. And if we take a step back, really beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of those, yeah. um, it's one of those mysteries of the, it's one of those mysteries of the way that the spirit weaves people together. And so, you know, Lori, like you would be one of the people that I would call when I would need uh, help figuring out a, a ministry question um, and vice versa. Yeah, and Leah's the person that I called with approximately 12 hours notice while I was driving across country and said, hey, um, any chance I can sleep at your house? Yeah. And I did, and she made me an apple pie. I did, I did. It was I awesome, did. yeah. And then at some point around that same time, we decided um, that we were too important to each other and, and each other's sort of wealth of like knowledge and wisdom was too important to not tap into on the regular. And so maybe two years ago, um, we started rendezvousing in the place that we found that was uh, equidistant between our two houses, which is Hillsboro, Indiana. And it was a tiny cafe in Hillsboro, Indiana, where we would meet um, and eat usually breakfast and lunch together. And uh -huh. Yes, and, and we need to note that Hillsboro, unknown to probably everybody who is watching us, is known as the home of 600 happy people and a few old sourheads. Yes. <laughs> That's their town slogan. And then we showed up. And I, and I will also note that, Leah, you and I noted similarities between our congregations. And we noted, first of all, how much we loved our people, mm -hmm. how unique our congregations seem to be. And we're not shy about saying that. Yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. some of the similar challenges and triumphs that we were enjoying and trudging through at really similar times. Yeah. And so... so yeah. And so, and so we would show up in Hillsborough, both with like a list of, of things that we wanted to talk through with each other um, about how we could continue to move our congregations forward. And we did that for about a year and then the pandemic happened. Yeah. And pandemic changed everything. And so we kept talking minus the really good food yep. and, um, and we just realized how much we needed each other. And then we realized that during this season, each of our congregations is enjoying this theme of again and again. Yeah. And we thought what better mm -hmm. way to go a little deeper than to share this reflection on scripture together. So um, today's theme is again and again, we are reformed. I think you and I both feel that Leah, that we are reformed constantly. Uh, and part of our relationship has been helping one another to do some of that reformation personally and professionally. Absolutely. Yeah. So why don't we dive in? Can I, can I lead us in prayer? Please, please do. Oh God, may the words of our mouths 
and the meditations of each of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight for you are our rock and our redeemer amen amen so the passage that our liturgists read for us today is john 12 20 through 33 but i think it's really important always for us to read things in context so that we know where does this thing take place? What happens before it and after it and around it? And if you look at John 12, um, the thing that happens right before this, um, this scene is that first, six days before the Passover, um, Jesus is in Bethany. He's hanging out with his friends, Mary and Martha and um, Mary anoints Jesus' feet with oil. Then there's this plot to kill Lazarus because Jesus has already raised him from the dead. And suddenly the authorities are like, oh, this guy means business. <laughs> we, we, need to, we need to take out this symbol of his power. And then the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which we always read on Palm Sunday, right? So it's this thing that we're going to read in a couple of weeks, but it's important for us to see where that happens in, in context. So I think what struck us was that three major stories, right? This anointing, Lazarus, and then the protest parade happen. And again, you're going to hear that, honestly, next week. <laughs> next week right. is Palm Sunday, everybody, just FYI. <laughs> so those are big stories. And that comes before today's passage. We can't get over that. Carry and it, on, Leah. And it, well, I mean, and it, and it seems really important for us to pay attention to these folks clamoring to talk to Jesus because of what they've just seen, right? They've just seen that there's a different way to live their lives because at the same time, Jesus is um, being led by the people through this, uh, through this declaration that he, he's the anointed one on the other side of town. Um, the, um, the military leaders are also having a parade Yep. And so, and so all of these people see that there's a different way for them to live their lives. Right. A and different this way. Happens. And they, there are a lot of different ways to live differently. Right. So there's a parade, there's a protest, yep. there's a lot of choices and people are clamoring. And in that we are told that some of them want to see Jesus. And I think this is sort of that first place where we both stopped and we're like, oh, there's something to learn here. Because we're told that the people yeah. tell Philip, but then Philip goes to Andrew and then they go together to talk to Jesus. And that really got me in a positive way because it, it told me that when something's important, we do it together. That doesn't mean we do anything not alone, right? There are certainly things that we have to do alone. This wasn't one of them. This is one where they were like, this is big. And it's so big that I'm going to tell you and you're going to get someone else. And then you're going to tell the person that I want to see. And both of us thought about that proverb, which I have since learned has um, questionable origins. So good luck looking up where this yeah. is from because <laughs> nobody agrees. Um, but there's a proverb out there that right. says, if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go well, go together. And that seemed to be a really good starting point for this passage. We're, we're really only in verse 22 at this point. Um, and we learned that going together matters. And so I just wonder if, yeah. if we can pause and say, what does it mean to go together? And who is it mm. that maybe you need to reach out to? I've called Leah a zillion times. Yeah. Um, and, and I've and, called Leah a zillion times. Yeah, I mean, there's just a thing about doing something together and having a circle of togetherness that this passage points directly back to. So the people go together and they do get to see Jesus and Jesus in his oh so creative ways does not give them a clear path forward. Is that a fair way of putting it? <laughs> it is a very fair way of putting it because he I does the thing that he always Jesus. does. Right, so <laughs> what, what Jesus does is 
says something fairly cryptic, but that we can learn from. Yeah. It has to do with. Yeah. And, he, and, <laughs> and, and he's forever doing this, right? He's forever looking at the natural world and saying, all oh, right, if you, if you want to know, if you want to know about, about God's ways, if then look at this thing or that thing or this thing or that thing. And in this case, he says, it's like this grain of wheat. And then the hard thing that he says is um, in order for do the thing that in order for it to do the thing that it was made to do, it has to be broken open. Yeah, let's just hold on to that. Uh, there should be a lot of foreshadowing here for us. Right. That. Um, that there's a lot of breaking that happens in the world. Um, and all we have to do is look around in the natural world to say, that's just part of life. Yeah. But it's not just it's the in the picturesque field of wheat. It's the brokenness that leads us to that. So when he gives them this cryptic metaphor, um, it's this reminder that there's this cycle of being formed and reformed and formed and reformed that happens over and over and over again with death and life and transformation and that change happens in all of those places over and over and over again. And I'm so glad that they're not alone when they hear this because um, I think they need each other to figure it out. Yeah, this is not something that they can just hear and say, I'm going to tuck that away and I'll learn for it from it and you go on your own. No, it, it really was. They needed to be with one another and engage those words and wrestle with them and, and realize that that brokenness was better held by the community mm -hmm. and not just on the shoulders of one. Yeah. Which... I think is why both of us, when we read this passage independently, we both got stuck on this next part, mm -hmm. which is that then this voice comes. And, and to be clear, uh, verse 30, we don't care about. <laughs> we want to throw that one out. Absolutely. And that's challenging. That's, that's for another day. <laughs> but verse 29 we found some real goodness in yeah. that the people are broken open. The voice of God comes and some of them hear it like thunder and some hear it like angels. And what struck me in that is that mm -hmm. I'm actually not sure who's hearing it um, the way it was. Right. Because, right. because, because sometimes we hear God so clearly in the thunder. Um, and sometimes when you think you're hearing angels, uh, it's, it's, it's that other, you know, little figure sitting on your shoulder, right? Um, totally. And, and there's, there's sort of a dichotomy here that the thunder for most of us is big and loud and has a certain tone to it. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, we don't hear angels in that way. Mm -hmm. So there's this real, mm -hmm. almost opposite play going on with what the people heard. And there's got to be a lesson in that. There's got to be something in there that says, we aren't all hearing the same thing, even though we're hearing the same words right. at times. And I think that was the moment that I said to you, Leah, remember that one time at the Hillsborough Cafe <laughs> When I was really wrestling with something uh, about our congregation and you said, I'm not hearing it that way. What you're saying and how you heard it, I don't hear it that way. And it was at that moment that my dear friend Leah pulled out a napkin. It wasn't a high quality, big napkin. It was a little slightly wet napkin. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, and you drew... Yeah, I'm like, what's that? I was like, I got to draw a thing on a napkin for you. Hang on. <laughs> you want me to draw the thing now? I do want you to draw the thing now, but can you not use a napkin? That'd be great. Absolutely. Okay, so let's see. Um, okay, so Lori, here's the thing that I drew for you.
Whenever people move through a situation, at the beginning of a situation, people always, always, there's always somebody who starts on board with the new. There are always people who are wedded to the old and folks have to move through the change in order to get there. But at the beginning of a situation, most people are on board with the old. That's what they've known. That's what they've experienced. That's what they're used to. And it takes some, like some working, <laughs> takes some doing, it takes some moving, some willingness to change. to be on board with that change, right? People have to be like willing to adapt. But then eventually, uh, if people are, they're willing to do the work, to put in the work, if they're open to the movement of the spirit, if they're open to God's um, spirit, moving them and changing them in ways that matter, instead of just being like broken, right? That they're broken open. <laughs> then eventually they get on board with the new. And the way that that works is like this. At the beginning of a situation, that's right here. Where are most of the folks? Are they... Are they already on board with the new? Are they part of the change or, or are they firmly entrenched in the old? It's a real question, Lori, not rhetorical. I'm just having a moment here. <laughs> so, <laughs> holy cow, people. I'm like having my own moment seeing my napkin come alive. And yeah, I remember being right in that spot and you asked me that question. I'm pretty sure I froze then too. And I was like, oh, right. Most of the people are in the old, in that beautiful yeah. blue spot. This feels so real, Leah. Well, I mean, it's real because of what we're experiencing, right? We're at, exactly. we're right here at this year of pandemic living. Yep. This year of pandemic living where suddenly there's a bunch of vaccinations on the horizon and things are starting to reopen. And so, and so, and so things are moving and shifting and moving and shifting and moving and shifting. Yep. That's what happens as time moves, as people's willingness to adapt to change happens, as we allow the Holy Spirit to break us open and to move us into a new place, people shift from the old into the change and then yep. they're firmly on board with the new. And that's this is where how we this saw works. the connection to the wheat, right? That broken openness and the way that right. that led change and new life. Yeah, and so and so Jesus is saying to them, um, all that stuff that you just saw happen, where I entered into Jerusalem, being a a, a new a new way of living. Well, there's a lot of change that's going to have to happen in order for you to get on board with that new way of living, and if you stay like you know, held on here to the old, then you're just going to stay like this piece of wheat that ends up not doing anybody any good because, because you won't be cracked open. And right. so at any, at any given point in time, right, we have to look to see, to see, well, how many people have shifted over to the new way of being? Are they still in the middle of adapting to the change or are they firmly, firmly, firmly wedded to old ideas. And so then as we move through time, even here at, 
at the very end, right? At the implementation of the new thing. Most people might be on board with the new thing, but there's always this little sliver of folks this little sliver of folks who are still adapting to the change and, and a bunch of folks who are still wedded to the old. And it's- Yeah, and keep that paper there because that's the community. It, the people who are wedded to the old are not thrown out. Right. And then the new people, you know, the people who are really excited about the newness are not the only ones that matter. And the ones that are really in the throes of change and doing that difficult work are, are indeed in the middle, right? But the whole community is represented. There is not a community in which everything is new or everything is old. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And this, like it might as well be a loop, right? Because it, because it happens over and over and over again. And at any given point in time, right, you can take a slice of time and look and you can see, ah, yes, this is how our community looks right now. And you can look at an organization and you can look at a church and know that in one area, we are holding on to a lot of old. And in another area, we are all about the new. And the entire church doesn't track to just one slice right? There are a lot of different arenas within the same community and that can bring life, right? Absolutely. There's something that's, that's being let go of and there's something else that we're holding on to. That's really hearkening back to that, um, that grain of wheat and the brokenness and the cycle of life that Jesus is pointing to, not just in himself, but around us. Absolutely. Because it's springtime right now. And if you look outside at your yard, even you're going to see this happening in your yard and you're going to see this happening in your yard and you're yep. going to see this happening in your yard. The same thing happens in our communities. And let's go a step further and say, if you look at your own self, you will also find that happening. There are some things that you are letting go of and that are dying off. And there's newness in you as well that maybe you didn't know about. And I think, Leah, you and I agree that the pandemic has brought this out in us. There are things that we've learned in pandemic we don't need anymore. Absolutely. And there's other stuff that we're like, I don't want to let that go. Absolutely. And it can be a real challenge which is why we go back to the beginning of the passage and remind ourselves that we can't do this alone. Mm -hmm. I think, it would Hey friend, I want you back on screen. <laughs> um, <laughs> She's coming back. I think it would be really interesting for people to draw this kind of diagram and to make themselves a little cutout window. Um, and to think about how time and your willingness to change in the spirit has helped shift things inside of you to be um, to be on board with the new stuff that God is doing in your life. So that sounds like an extra credit challenge that we can put out to both of our congregations. Absolutely. I mean, Leah did this first on a napkin. You all have something on which you can create this and then locate yourselves. And we would love to join you on that journey. Yeah. And do some journaling about it, definitely. Hmm. So as you continue to think about that image of change, we offer you this image of a heart. You've seen it before today. And it comes from the inspiration in the book of Jeremiah. Just listen as you embrace the internal change that you have going on. Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them up out of the land of Egypt, a covenant they broke, though I was their spouse, says Yahweh. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahweh. I will put my law in their minds and on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. That's God's end game always. That 
that we know that God is our God and that we are God's people again and again and again. We are formed and reformed, formed and reformed. That's what God is always trying to work out in us and through us, through every through every old thing, change and new thing. Always. And it's the thing that God is trying to work out in and through our churches, right? This isn't just about us and us alone. It's also about these communities of which we are a part. Lori, it makes me think of how um, it might've been one of the last uh, in-person meetings in Hillsboro that you and I had um, over pie no and chicken livers. No idea what style. she's thinking about. <laughs> I can hardly wait, Leah. <laughs> um, where, where we, Waiting? Were, we were talking about, um, we were talking about how long we've been at our churches. And at that time, um, you had been at your church for like 17 years. And at that time I had been at my church for 10 years. And it, we were talking about how like, we had hit the sweet spot with our congregations and that we felt like we were, um, our congregations were at this place where we were really ready to live into some big new stuff that had been churning and changing and breaking open for a long time. And how we were at a similar place in our ministries. And that felt really good. It was a great moment. I know exactly where we were. We were actually in your house. You were in your recliner. I was on the couch. Oh. And I remember taking a deep breath. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It was late at night. Mm. And we were right, like you said, at that sweet spot. And then pandemic. Yeah. And then pandemic, which feels like it's, um, like it's been changed that of course is not welcomed. And at the same time, we've learned so much about who we are as a church. I think both of our churches have Oh, for in real. this pandemic time. Mm-hmm. Right. And so the question of, um, how will we allow God to form and reform us? And will we be open to the spirits leading in change? And are we willing to do it together? Yeah, because like it, Jesus, we long for, oh, because like Jesus, we long for this positive change in the world and we can't, we can't do it alone ever. Exactly. And what you and I have often reminded one another is that the thing about reformation is that we already have the stuff of reformation inside of us. It's not external. Reforming is taking what's already there and using it in a different way. And you and I both see that potential in our congregations. I hope that's clear to you all. Like there is an intense love and desire and um, energy for what you, the people do in two different places, but with very similar hearts. And we are right at the cost of continued reformation. The stuff is already within us and it's about to be changed Mm -hmm. again. And that's exhausting and it's inspiring and it is the work of the church. You want to pray together? Yeah. Um, Yeah. Let's use a, let's use this poem that's in, that's in the uh, devotional that, that folks have. This one? (laughs) That one. Yeah, this is called Keep Digging and it's by Reverend Sarah R. I can feel change inside of me. It's a slow burn. Change usually starts out hot, defensive, and angry. A self-righteous blanket of, I am right and here's why. I wrap it around my shoulders like a barricade. I fight the temptation to lean forward. To play the challenger, to argue with confidence. But in time, 
almost always. The heat fades. The air leaves the balloon. The audacity of it all starts to wear off. And eventually, what I am left with is myself. And a big open sky. It's colder here. It's quieter. I can hear my thoughts. And in this big, wide openness, I am able to say out loud, maybe I wasn't right. Maybe I need to learn. Maybe it's time for change. Maybe that's okay. And if I'm quiet, and if I'm paying attention, I can usually hear God whisper inside of me, good work, my child. Now, keep digging. Amen. Amen. Spirit of Open to the Spirit, we come to prayer. And let's be real, we've been praying this entire time with images, words, guitars, organ, piano, voice, but not silence. So let's trust that what we need for prayer is already within us. Let's trust that God will reform our wandering minds and our questioning hearts. And let's get lost in just a few moments of silent prayer. with some of us longing for more and others among us overwhelmed by how much we have. We pray the words that Jesus taught us. Our Creator God, holy be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, 
and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Have mercy, O Lord. Good morning, St. Peter's. I'm Tim Tomlinson, and I'm really pleased to have the opportunity this morning to share a little bit about what St. Peter's means to me and my family. Uh, we first came to St. Peter's in the summer of 2015 uh, and actually uh, found St. Peter's having uh, gone to the, the Pride Festival uh, earlier that month, uh, very intentionally looking to see if uh, there were churches represented uh, at Pride that were open and affirming congregations, though at, at the time we were not really familiar with that language. Uh, but having Having uh, met a couple people from St. Peter's at the booth, we decided to come try a service one morning. Uh, and we, we found, you know, first of all, that St. Peter's was exactly what it advertised itself to be in, in terms of truly being a, an open and affirming congregation that was welcoming to all and, and seeing the prevalence of the covenant of welcome uh, really made us feel just that welcome. Uh, and the other thing that really impressed me on that first visit to St. Peter's was that it was a uh, it was a confirmation Sunday and there were a couple of young members of the congregation uh, that were offering, you know, sort of their statements of faith uh, at the conclusion of, of their confirmation process as they were choosing to, you know, to, to fully select to join the community. And I was really just struck in that service by the authenticity the grounding in truth uh and just what to me seemed the bravery of these young people who stood in front of the congregation and many of them said you know some form of this community is important to me but it's not really about a specific thing or set of things that i that i do or don't believe uh and that was very refreshing to me, having grown up in, in very conservative church settings, uh, having for uh, uh, the previous number of years uh, been part of, uh, you know, kind of a, a big box evangelical con congregation here in Hamilton County uh, that, that we had come to and continued to be associated with for a number of reasons, mostly for me uh, in the idea that, that they, they, they advertised themselves to be a, a, a seeker-friendly uh, congregation that, that practiced um, a generous orthodoxy, I believe was the language. Um, and and at first that was very attractive to me. I will say I found over time that that church was was very friendly to seekers uh, so long as as the destination that they arrived at was the one that they considered correct, right? Um, and I would say over time, you know, it had become clearer and clearer to us that uh, that for a variety of reasons, that was the, not the best, the best church home for my wife, for myself, for our our family. As uh, my kids were 
uh, growing into their teenage years, uh, discovering themselves, and uh, and as uh, a couple of them recently had come out to us, and and thus the reason why it was very important to us to find an open and affirming congregation, because while we had certainly never agreed with, you know, sort of the interpretation of the condemnation of, of homosexuality at, at that church, I guess it was something we were willing to ignore. Um, and, you know, I'm a bit ashamed of that now, um, knowing sort of the trauma that that caused my kids as they were discovering themselves. And, and that is the reason why, or a reason why St. Peter's is, is so vitally important in this community and, and why we choose to be members of the St. Peter's community to support St. Peter's financially, uh, and why I was very pleased to have the opportunity to contribute my time and talents uh, to St. Peter's as a, a member of Governance Council for the last several years. Um, our community needs St. Peter's. Uh, our community needs a community of faith that is grounded in love and welcome uh, and where anyone who seeks love and a connection to the sacred can come in and find support in that journey on their own terms surrounded by love and i know that that has been very very true for me and that it has been so important to me personally to feel completely welcome at St. Peter's and completely loved in a way that is not predicated on acceptance of a particular theology or dogma or orthodoxy, but simply as one who seeks after the sacred in life uh, and that believes that all things sacred are grounded in love and that any statement of philosophy or religion that is not fully grounded in love um, and love for all is not something that, uh, that I can support. And so I'm so grateful for St. Peter's. You know, I'm grateful that over my kids' high school years that I had teenagers that on Saturday nights would ask us, hey, can we go to church tomorrow? Um, which to me is is just a beautiful and crazy thing. And, and that it really has been a home and a community uh, that our family has felt privileged to be a part of. And so thank you all for making us feel welcome in that way. We believe that flowers need the rain. We believe that humans need community. We believe that bodies need rest. And we believe that hearts need connection. We believe that mornings need sunrise. And we believe that the season must change. We believe that grief needs space. And we believe that change needs time. We believe that love needs security, and we believe that pain needs art. We believe that joy needs company, and we believe that our spirits need God. Again and again, our spirits need God. Fortunately for us, we trust that God is here. God is at work in our lives. God is a lighthouse keeper that never gives up. Thanks be to God.
Amen. Again and again, God meets us. Again and again, we are called to listen. Again and again, we are shown the way. Again and again, God loves first. Again and again, we are reformed. As you leave this time and space, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arms hold those in need. May your feet walk toward justice. May your heart trust in its worth. May your soul dance in God's grace. And may this be your rhythm again and again and again until God's promised day. In the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself, go with courage, go with heart, go in peace. Amen.